You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So we might as well just keep on rolling on, man. There's not too many other uh, big needs, I suppose. I don't feel the need to talk about defensive tackle. We'll probably stay away from cornerback. Might do edge rusher, we'll see. I know it's a massive need, but I just... The only reason I feel like we should do it is because although I look at it and go, eh, I don't know. And, and the biggest problem is we've been talking about value and you look at safety and guard, and it's like, man, the the potential to upgrade the team in a way that's not going to break the bank is just sitting right there for us. Again, I'm not talking about Khalil Mack level upgrades because that's a once in a lifetime thing. And that, unless you're getting, you know, an Aaron Rodgers quarterback, I don't know how else you can upgrade a team more than a guy like Khalil Mack. But the problem with a guy like Khalil Mack is that you got to pay him $25 million, and that's kind of the problem when I look at edge rusher. We're talking about guys that are maybe upgrades, but could be not very much help at all, and we're paying a minimum of, what, $12 million? I don't even know if there's anybody at guard or safety that could command $12 million, and that's kind of the floor for a lot of these edge rushers. And if we get top, top, top edge rush guys, I mean, again, Khalil set the... the the top of the market last year at 25. We're a year later. The guy at the top of the market this year, even though he's not as good as Khalil Mack, could he get 20, you think? I'm just saying, I, I don't know. What up, dance party? Mmm, on a Monday. Get you ready to start the week, man. I'm ready to go. I'm going to run right through a wall. Maybe I'll just drink more coffee. I don't know. Just kind of playing it by ear right now, but I'm, I am fired up. Oh, Coffee was a good choice. Stay tuned on the wall. But that's what makes me nervous about it. And it, it's the reason why I wouldn't mind the draft as a better option. Because with the draft, you're getting somebody pretty cheap. And when you tell me that we can, you know, let's just say we can get a guy like Ja'Kai Polite. I'm looking at a couple guys that are... I mean, it's it's not impossible that Ja'Kai Polite comes in and is as good as a guy that we could get in free agency... Except the guy in free agency is going to be $18 million, and Ja'Kai Polite is going to be, what, four? No, correction, three. Three million dollars. Let's talk about it, actually. Year one, 2.9. Year two, 3.6. Year three, 4.3. Year four, five million bucks. That's four years of production for about $16 million over four years, and we've got a fifth-year option with a first-round pick. The overall value of that to me, and, and it, yes, we can do both, but I'm, I'm just saying, it, it just, I'm very, prote- I'm Ted Thompson-esque as far as being protective of my money. And in fact, I would argue I'm more protective than Ted Thompson, because when I see Ted Thompson spend $8 million on a guy that's not upgrading the team, I, I want to just do a little mini slap, just a little baby one, just a tiny slap. It would barely even hurt him, barely hurt him sting a little bit though i just can't handle that it drives me nuts but anyways let's talk about wide receiver today we're going to follow a similar format to what we've been doing which is look at players that are talked about as being potential release candidates people that have been released people that are free agents whatever whatever and just kind of look at specifically what are we getting with this player Rather than just, because I think a lot of time free agency is dumbed down to, I know that name, therefore good, therefore pay money, therefore Super Bowl. It's just a little, you know, not super well thought out. And sometimes we just don't realize that, you know, the, our last our last lasting memory of this guy was pretty positive. Like Cole Beasley we talked about as being not very good and not really much better than uh, Randall Cobb, but yet everybody seems to want him. I mean, we're talking, he's not even younger. So talent is the same, age is the same. The only reason it would be a benefit is if we cut Cobb and pay Cole Beasley a lot less money, and then we're getting a cheaper uh, Randall Cobb. But at the, in that case, wouldn't it just make sense to restructure Cobb and just pay him less money? I mean, just be like, hey, you want to play for like $4 bucks? 
because we'll we'll let you hang around for that. Just saying. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. But all right, let's take a little look-see. So right out of the gate, we talked about uh, Cole Beasley, the Dallas Cowboy, but there's a couple other people that are uh, listed as potential cut candidates. Uh, the first is, or the first two, are Alan Hearns and Terrence Williams. Uh, it was announced, I don't know, a week ago or so, the Cowboys said that they are not going to be picking up Terrence Williams' option. So he will be a free agent. I, I have to assume, or that leads me to believe, at least in some capacity, that they are going to keep Alan Hearns. In other words, it was an either-or situation, and they decided they're going to let Terrence Williams walk because it's going to hurt a little bit, although... Neither of them are superstars to get rid of Alan Hearns and Terrence Williams. But Terrence Williams, former uh, third-round pick, 6'2", 210, and he's 29 years old. I mean, the bottom line with Terrence Williams is I, I'm going to go ahead and classify him as a Ted Thompson pickup. I don't see him as being any better than Randall Cobb or any better than the younger guys that we have, and that's assuming the young guys don't really grow. Terrence Williams is, I mean, he he's depth, man. You, just, you throw him in, and he just is an addition to the pile he's one of the guys that you're waiting to see if they can emerge as a number two he's another one of those guys that we pick up that's not very good and everybody goes yeah but but he's with Aaron Rodgers so that's gonna make him a superstar and then he's not so that's just my opinion I know he's probably one of the guys that somebody is gonna at least jump up and say yeah we can get Terrence Williams I mean he's not a superstar but he could be a number two I don't think so I mean, it, it's not even a situation to where I would say, okay, but what? how much does he want? Because, again, I, I don't want to just sign a bunch of players that aren't going to contribute for two, three, four million dollar contracts because that'll eat up our money really quick. And what have we accomplished other than just throwing away money and taking up space on a 53-man roster, getting rid of some potential developmental talent so that we can have Terrence Williams go out and do what we could get out of Jamon Moore. So I'm out on Terrence Williams. Thank you very much. And for the record, in case Hearns hits the free agent market, he's the exact same situation. He's just another guy. In my opinion, that's what he is. Somebody that is a bit more intriguing is Mr. Deshaun Jackson. Deshaun Jackson is 32 years old, but if you take a look at Deshaun Jackson and his production over the course of his career, essentially there is one year where he was really good, one year where he was not very good. You you take away the, the one low year and the one high year, this guy has been consistent and actually almost consistently getting better every year since 2008. If we look at it, 70s for pro football focus is good. From 2008 to 2011, he was barely good, kind of that low 70s mark, and he had one of his bad years in there. If you look 2012 to 2016, he had his one really, really good year in 2013, but it's mostly mid 70s 74 70, 74 to 73 to 76 you look 2017 and 2018 with Tampa Bay it was high 70s and 2018 was was basically in the 80s which would have been his only his second year in the 80s just to give you an idea now it's it's inconsistent i think that you're going to find that with Deshaun Jackson all the time but that's probably true of most guys that are uh speed slash deep threat guys they're not home run hitters every single week sometimes teams are able to take that away whatever but the bottom line is Deshaun Jackson is still Deshaun Jackson. He maybe still can't run a 4-3-5, I don't know. But he's still got it, man. He's still Deshaun Jackson. And, you know, maybe part of the reason we don't really think about Deshaun Jackson as still being Deshaun Jackson is because he's, well, I mean, he didn't, he hasn't really had that kind of chemistry since Michael Vick. I mean, he went over and played with Kirk Cousins in Washington. Not that Kirk Cousins is bad. And Deshaun wasn't bad. I mean, he had 1,000 yards. He crossed that 1,000-yard mark with with Kirk Cousins in Washington. 
But then beyond that, think he, think about what happened in Tampa Bay. Th- those are not good quarterbacks. I know Fitzmagic kind of had some, some fits of greatness. <laughs> oh, got him. But those are not great quarterbacks. So I'm interested, but the, the big question is going to be how much money. Um, because he might still be commanding a lot of money. My thought process coming into this is, eh, I don't think he's going to be, you know, I don't know if he's going to be worth all that much. But here's sort of the issue is Tamp- or he's still under contract with Tampa Bay, so more than likely they're going to be looking to trade him. Well, the man's current contract is for $10 million. That's somewhat problematic for me because I don't know that I want to spend $10 million. I talked about the fact that in 20, uh, 2020, we're going to be paying over $16 million for Devontae Adams. So I just think in general the Packers, and, and maybe you don't care, but I'm telling you, they said directly that part of the reason they cut Jordy Nelson is because we were spending too much money at wide receiver. You can't spend too much money at one position because it hurts your ability to spend money at other positions of need. We also have to factor in again that we're paying Aaron Rodgers a lot more next year, which means we have less money to go around at each and every position. So if we overspend at quarterback and overspend at wide receiver, we're we're really just stretching ourselves too thin. So I just don't see huge money being spent on Deshaun Jackson. Now, the only caveat would be if we trade with the Buccaneers and he does agree to a smaller contract, the question is how much would he be willing to go down? And and we're, we he still has his, his contract, so essentially it would be an extension. The problem then there is that he's 32 years old. Are you going to sign him to a three-year contract? Three years, $21 million? Which, from his standpoint, is um, two additional years for 11 additional million dollars, which is only $5.5 million more per year. So I don't know. I mean, it... it is in just flat out talent? Yeah, man, I'll take it all day. I know some people say, well, we don't need speed guys on the outside. That's exactly what we have. Well, we'll see. I would agree that overspending at wide receiver could become problematic, uh, not just because of our financial situation, but if you pay this guy $10 million and then the guys that we drafted do emerge, you're kind of in a, a crummy situation. So I will say that I'm probably more willing to spend at positions like safety or even at guard. Um, first of all, because if you for for 10 million bucks you're getting maybe the best safety in the in, in the NFL free agent market. For 10 million bucks at a wide receiver you're getting a, a 32 year old over the hill speedster. So my personal preference would be I don't want to spend 10 million dollars on anybody. But again, he's an option and in terms of talent, no question he comes in and he's number 2. I I don't really have any reservation saying that even if some of the guys take a step, if they're taking a step above where Deshaun Jackson is, either they took a massive step into like top 15 wide receiver territory or Deshaun Jackson took a major step back or a combination of the two so yes on Deshaun Jackson not including the contract looking at the contract I would say it's unbelievably unlikely that's that's my current thought on that another name that's been bantered about a bit is Nelson Aguilar there's some question about the Eagles and who they may keep or release um, if it's Golden Tate, we can have that conversation, but as far as Nelson Aguilar, I, you know, there's just nothing here for me, man. It's, it's a Ted Thompson thing. I know he's a name that you've heard before, and I know he's had some success as a, as a guy over in, in Philly, but he's, he's, n- I don't even know if I can say he's as good as Randall Cobb, and, it, you know, he's gonna be cheap. I mean, he could be a $3 million contract for all I know, but I just, I don't want to spend $3 million on him because I don't see the point. I mean, it, it listen, Again, they have the personnel department. They have the ability to see certain things. He's a he's only 25. You know, former first round pick runs a 4.42. If if you think there's something there, and and for dirt cheap, okay, we can take a look. And and granted, in 2017 he was pretty good, but that's one year out of four. And if we look at this past year in terms of his ability to be consistently good, he had four games where he was graded as good. Four. That's a full season with no injuries and two playoff games. So we're talking 18 games. He had four that were good. He had six in which he was graded below average, two of which are graded as very, very bad. I'm not interested. I'm just not. I don't care that he's young. I don't care that he's fast. I don't care that he's a first-round pick. I think it was a bad pick. I think we've all learned it was a bad pick, and I'm just not interested in allocating money to him. To be specific, uh, Nelson Aguilar was the 104th best wide receiver last year, which 
technically is better than than anybody we had at wide receiver not named Devonte adams which should put give you some perspective on how bad our wide receivers were for all of you who are saying we've got plenty we got we're there, we're fine at wide receiver nelson Aguilar would be our number two wide receiver at 104th best i'm looking for a top 50 guy that can be a number two wide receiver i can't even get a top 100 guy right now but nelson Aguilar was 105th excuse me equinemius was 105th nelson Aguilar was 104th Again, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about here. Not interested. Uh, a couple other relatively big names that I'm not interested in. Torrey Smith and Cameron Meredith from the Saints. Torrey Smith from uh, Carolina. Torrey Smith hasn't even been a good wide receiver since his time in Baltimore in 2014. He's been pretty terrible ever since. Cameron Meredith, I mean, if he can't do it with Drew Brees, he just can't do it. And the fact is, he just can't really do it. So, if you hear those names pop up, again... Do your own homework. Do whatever you want to do to decide it for yourself if you want them. But I'm just telling you, they're not any good. And I'm not interested in paying for names just for the sake of paying for names. Because I think we got good enough names with Equinemius St. Brown and Marquez Valdez scaling. Um, a, a pretty high-risk, over-the-hill wide receiver that we could possibly look take a look at is Michael Crabtree. And the reason I would be somewhat willing is because he there's no question he's had a good career and he's a talented wide receiver. Um, he's had some really awesome years with San Francisco. I think he was a he was a pretty solid wide receiver with Oakland, but in 2018 he had a terrible year. But it was with Baltimore, and Baltimore was pretty terrible, especially as far as their quarterbacks that they were trotting out. But you also have to factor in the guy's 31 years old. So I'm looking at a guy who is older, and his last year was a terrible year. And by every account, Baltimore is going to be cutting him. So the question we would have to ask is. Was his massive regression in 2018 more so due to his age, or was it due to the fact that he played for the Baltimore Ravens? Because although Michael Crabtree wasn't the top guy, there was not a single wide receiver that was graded out as good for the Baltimore Ravens. So you got to kind of wonder how much of that has to do with the wide rec- or the quarterback. If we were able to get 2017 production out of Michael Crabtree, we're looking at a top 50 guy. Not elite. He's not you know, number one guy anymore, but if, again, if, if he can be 2017, 2016, 2015, that guy again, like he was with the Oakland Raiders, we've got our number two, and then it's just a matter of how much is he going to cost. Well, um, he signed a three-year contract with the Baltimore Ravens, and this was in 2018, so it was just a year ago. So a year ago, it was a three-year, $21 million contract, so $7 million a year. Now, supposedly, they're cutting him, so we're not going to have to worry about his present contract. I wouldn't. I would actually prefer that they trade him because then we can lock him up for whatever base salary they've got, which is five million and then six million. But but in and around that five million dollars, I'm I'm kind of curious about Michael Crabtree. It could be a bust, and for five million dollars, it, it's a big question mark. So maybe it's just not worth it. Maybe just don't take the risk, save the cap money, put it in something a little more of a certainty, and then um, focus on the draft for wide receiver because there's plenty of them draft and development because we also have a lot of wide receivers as well but it you know at the very least again depending on the cost you've got a veteran wide receiver like michael crabtree it could be a good presence for the locker room i'm I'm, it's kind of a reach there's no question about it i'm just saying it's it's an option it's kind of a a yawn kind of thing and if the packers did sign him don't go jumping up and down like oh man he's so good like eh, maybe kind of good but it's it's a high risk medium reward kind of situation. Not, I guess not high risk, because we're, if we're talking four or five million bucks. If we pay him seven million dollars, then yes, it's it's high risk again. I already talked about Devontae Parker not too long ago. To summarize once again, it, it all comes down to how much he's going to want. If he wants like a seven, eight, nine, ten million dollar contract, I'm out. But I know there are some people who are out there saying, I don't know why everybody's so high on Devontae Parker. The reason is because I think he can be a number two. I think he can be that top 50 guy. He's only 26 years old, former first-round pick, 6'3", 216, runs a 4'4'5", so he's got the height, he's got the build, he's got the speed. Uh, He, I mean, playing with Tannehill, he was was a top 50 guy. He's got the injury history, but again, that could play into him getting a cheaper contract, and, you know, I'm kind of sticking around that $5 million mark. If you're giving me a potential number two for $5 million, especially Devontae Parker at 26... With his athletic makeup, again, 6'3", runs a 4'4'5", at least he used to. I don't mind it. 
I'm not over the moon. I'm not going to pretend he's an elite prospect. I'm not, you know, if, if, if we're talking a $10 million guy, I'm going to laugh. It's That's a joke. But if he's reasonable in understanding that he's been a mid-tier wide receiver for four years with a pretty big injury history and is willing to, you know, even go at $6 million, I'm willing to take a look at him. Because I feel like it's an instant upgrade. Because we don't have a second wide receiver, again, depending on growth, but we don't have a guy on the team outside of Devontae Adams that's as good as Devontae Parker, even Devontae Parker on a bad day. His worst year is better than any number two that we've got. Again, he's a top 50 guy. We don't even have a top 100 guy outside of Devontae right now. I'm sure we will in 2019. Somebody will break into that. Hopefully we can get, you know, maybe top 75 or something cool. But I'm just saying, depending on the price, Devontae Parker is kind of the guy I'm looking for. This level of talent here. And, and you know, the only reason that I would lean toward Devontae Parker as opposed to Crabtree is, again, Crabtree's we're, we're pushing 32. Big drop off. I don't know how much of that is his age. Devontae Parker, maybe his injuries are a concern, but he's, he's, he's in his prime, man, 26 years old. He's ready to rock and roll. And to be completely honest, he's the kind of, he's he's sort of the perfect candidate for that one year contract. Give him a one year seven million dollar contract. Give I mean we could offer him more if it's one year because now we're not even worried about the next year having to worry about, you know, him and Devontae adding up to too much money. If it's a one year prove it deal because he's like, Look, man, forget those injuries, forget the Miami Dolphins and what I was able to produce there. Give me a year with Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. And then at 27 years old, I'm going to come back and get my, you know, three, four-year, $10 million contract. Depending on how the market shakes up, which could be a little bit less, I think a one-year deal with a top-tier quarterback could be a good option. So maybe that would be the best play for a guy like Devontae Parker. Pay up a little bit more, do a one-year contract, and just rent him. As we continue to develop our guys, as we continue to draft more talent, let's just do a one-year rental. I think it makes perfect sense. doesn't have to be Devontae. But I'm starting to really like the one-year rental idea. Let's just leave it at that. The other guy to consider is Danny Amendola out of Miami. Um, you know, the, I mean, the biggest issue with him is that he's 33 years old. I think, you know, we don't necessarily have the same kind of injury history. He played, um, looks like, the entire year last year. I'm not saying he's never been injured. I'm just saying he's not Devontae Parker injured, like, every year, half the year. But again, maybe Amendola could be a one-year rental. He's not great. He didn't have a good year last year. We've seen the spark, you know, with him in New England. I think he was pretty good. Uh, he was good with the Rams when he was with the Rams. I think I would I would be... If, if Devontae Parker and Danny Amendola both were on the market for $5 million bucks, I'm taking Devontae Parker. If you said Amendola for 5 or Devontae Parker for 7 I might still take Devontae Parker. Just to kind of put it in perspective on where I'm at with this. I think Danny Amendola has too many bad games. I think he has too many bad years with flashes in between. And and again, I, I think we're, with Danny Amendola, we're getting a guy that is probably in and around, maybe a little bit better than Randall Cobb, but I'm not willing to dump Randall Cobb and pick up Danny Amendola, who's just maybe a half a tick better. But we're talking about Randall Cobb, who's a lot younger than Danny Amendola. So I, I'm not at all opposed to a one-year extension with Randall Cobb at this point, just depending on how things shake out. So I would take Devontae Parker over Danny Amendola, and to be honest, I would take Randall Cobb over Danny Amendola, depending on if Randall Cobb would take a pay cut. And I'm assuming he's going to have to, because there's no question his production has been dropping like a rock uh, for quite some time. I mean, as I've said, 2014 was sort of his peak. 2012 through 2014 was sort of his heyday. But, um, you know, he hasn't even had a good year since 2016. Granted, 2017 was the year without Aaron Rodgers. 2018 was the year in which he got injured. So maybe if we just kind of block out those two years and give him the benefit of the doubt, then we're still talking about a guy that's that's heads and tails above Danny Amendola and is only 28 years old, meaning he's got, what, three good years left? But again, you look at the drop in production, you look at the fact that he was injured last year, the fact that he's getting a year older, he's got to do something with this contract. I'm not opposed to re-signing him, but I just I don't want it for a lot of money. Uh, Travis Benjamin with the Chargers is an option. That's going to be a big no. Same with Seth Roberts and the Oakland Raiders. They may be cutting him. He's never been any good, so no thank you. I've also already talked about Emmanuel Sanders. Uh, he, you know, again, it's going to depend on the the price tag. If he's willing to do a one year rental, I'm ready to just shut down the podcast right now and just call it a deal. I don't know that he would be, but uh, as I've said, Emmanuel Sanders isn't just a top fifty guy. We're talking about a top twenty guy. 
and that's with him not having a good quarterback for quite some time. Emmanuel Sanders hasn't dropped off. He just hasn't had a quarterback, which is why he hasn't had the highlights that he had back when Manning was still around. But in terms of his product, he, he hasn't dropped off, man. He's still solid. So if Emmanuel Sanders does end up walking away, yes, I'm interested. The only question is going to be the contract situation. I don't know what it is, and because I've already talked about him, and because uh, it's, it's very much speculation at this point, I'm just going to leave it at that. Another guy that's being talked about that is probably not going to happen, but it's worth talking about because, well, if anybody else gets that information out there, it's going to be a big a big talking point because a lot of Packer fans wanted him last year and they didn't get him. But um, Allen Robinson with the Chicago Bears. Again, very unlikely because we're talking about a team that spent a lot of money to get him and um, is clearly their number one wide receiver. The problem is, as I said prior to you know them even signing him, Allen Robinson isn't all that great. Similar to the Kirk Cousins situation when everyone's like, oh, dude, he's so good, we're in trouble now. It's like, well, I mean, he's all right. Allen Robinson has always just been kind of all right. So the Bears got him now. They're kind of realizing that he's just all right, and he's definitely not worth the $15 million cap hit they're about to get this year, and in 2020, another $15 million. And again, the Bears, as we talked about before, have no money. They don't have any money left. So it's a, it's a tough situation because there's there's no way in my mind they're getting rid of Allen Robinson because then they just don't have an offense at all. You don't have a quarterback. You don't have another wide receiver outside of Allen Robinson, depending on the development of, uh, what's his name, your rookie from last year. Your running backs are just kind of okay. Your your offensive line is starting to deteriorate. you got to keep Allen Robinson. However, again, no money. If you cut him, you save an additional $8 million. If you're able to trade him, you save $11 million. Now, if he were a trade piece, and I don't think he would bring very much based on, number one, his production, and number two, the fact that he's carrying with him a $9.9 million base salary, and that gets factored into the value that you're getting from the Chicago Bears. Right? Think of it, think of it as somebody giving you a car and the, the loan that they're, the money that they still pay on. There's a difference between somebody who gives you a $50,000 car and there's $10,000 of, of debt still on the car. It's like, okay, well, then I owe you $40,000. If you give me a $10,000 car and you owe $10,000 on it, I'm not giving you anything. That's, I'm, I'm, no, <laughs> you get no compensation from me. That's kind of what we're looking at with Allen Robinson. You can't just say, oh, Allen Robinson is a $50,000 car. Okay, well, you still owe $45,000 and you're transferring that debt on to me. So I'll give you five grand for it, but I'm not giving you fifty thousand dollars for a fifty thousand dollar car, and then paying off the forty five thousand dollars remaining on the debt because I'm not paying ninety five thousand dollars for a fifty thousand dollar car. So the Bears wouldn't get very much in a trade, but they may just trade him to offload the eleven million dollars this year, and then the full fifteen million dollars next year. But if they did that, it would be a GM acknowledging he made a horrific mistake and it would make him look really dumb. And I don't think GMs want to do that because he has an owner that may look at that and say, you know what, you traded way up to get Mitch Trubisky, that's not panning out. You paid a ton of money to get Allen Robinson, the next year you ship him off and we're paying $4 million in dead cap this year, or I think $7 million if they just cut him. I'm not too happy with how this is turning out here. So again, probably not going to happen. They're just going to eat that money and hope that he can emerge as a somewhat better wide receiver. Now, in terms of Allen Robinson, I, I understand that I'm, I'm knocking him only as a $15 million man. As a just wide receiver, he is a good wide receiver. I mean, he, he can step in and, and be an easy number two. There's no question about it. But he carries with him the injury history that you're going to get with uh, Devontae Parker. And at 25 years old, I think it would make more sense, you know, again, he's probably staying with the Bears, but if you were to go somewhere else, it would make sense for Allen Robinson to find a, a team that's willing to pay him for a long time. And I just, I'm not all that interested. If his market is still anywhere near 15 million, even 10 million, it's like, eh, maybe he's worth it. I just don't know if I want him. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll draft Hakeem Butler in the second round. I don't need Allen Robinson. By the way, I watched Hakeem Butler yesterday and I, I really like him. I haven't spent time ranking my wide receivers but typically when I've been watching them it's just been kind of casually and it's like yeah he's all right I guess Hakeem Butler definitely stood out to me and it was only one game and it was against Texas but I didn't see him run one route where I was like oh he he was horrible it was just and he just looks it makes it look so easy that's what I love about him everything just looks easy if he wants to get behind the guy he always gets behind the guy when when, when we're talking contested catches he just sticks his long arms out there and he snatches the ball like it's nothing he doesn't look afraid he's not like you know, lower in his shoulders, like, oh, I'm going to get hit. He just, I don't know. I like him. I like him. 
I'm just saying, I like him. But anyways, that's that's sort of my thought in general on Allen Robinson, who's probably not getting traded. But again, if there's even some swirling news that makes it to Packers Twitter, it's just going to explode. So just make sure you understand, this is the situation. In 2018, he didn't even play the full year. He graded out as uh, very good, but that was an inconsistent very good. That was nine games where he was average or less. Five games where he was good and very good. So most of the time, he was not very good. It's just a matter of the average was just average, and then you add it to the average very good, and it kind of comes out to above, well above average. But it's, it's inconsistent. And he's hurt a lot. And he's expensive. And I don't want to give the Bears anything for him, because I don't want to give the Bears anything ever. So best case scenario, they decide to offload him. Somebody else takes him far, far away. We don't have to worry about him. We don't have to worry about the Bears, and all is right with the world. Looking at uh, current free agents now, uh, Demarius Thompson, Demarius Thompson, Demarius Thomas. Um, he, to be completely honest, and I know when he was with Denver, it was like Demarius was number two, Emmanuel Sanders, or Demarius is number one, Emmanuel Sanders is number two. My brain is just going back to sleep. I haven't had a sip of my, I finished my coffee like 30 minutes ago. And brain's like, nope, if you ain't going to pump me full of coffee, I'm going to bed. But I, you know. In my mind, to be completely honest, although maybe that is the correct way of looking at it, I kind of see it as 1A, 1B. Beyond that, though, Demarius Thomas is 31 years old. He didn't have a great year last year, but that was with half a year with Denver, half a year with Houston. It's kind of hard to gauge that, but still, no question he's been in a bit of a decline. His heyday was kind of between 2012 and 2014. 2015, 2016, he was still a good wide receiver. 2017, 18, technically good. I mean, to be completely honest, I think Demarius Thomas was better than Allen Robinson. And Demarius, and, and that's the thing. You look at the narrative, and Demarius Thomas was garbage, and Allen Robinson is good. That's just not the case. Allen Robinson might have a might have higher highs, but I think Demarius, in in a year where he played for two different teams, had had less lows. He was more consistently a good wide receiver. So if we kind of erase 2018, and we don't really have to because it looks like a pretty consistent gradual drop. But I think again, I mean. It, I think most people are looking at Demarius Thomas like he's washed up and he's over the hill. First of all, maybe and to some degree, but I would take him over... Again, we're talking one-year rental now. He's going to be a lot cheaper than Emmanuel Sanders. He would be a lot, a lot, lot cheaper than Allen Robinson, and I'm talking about similar talent. He doesn't have the injury history of Devontae Parker. And a lot of these other guys, Nelson Aguilar and everybody else that a lot of Packer fans are going to say he'd be a good, good guy. Demarius is a number two. And in 2017, he was the 36th highest graded wide receiver. 36th. That's perfect, man. That, that's, a, that's a high-end number two. Even if he continues to decline, we're talking about a probably still a top 50 guy. And remember, he hasn't been playing with very good quarterbacks. I mean, maybe in Houston, fine. But even in Houston, they got a problem with no wide... You know, they, they don't have a good offensive line. There wasn't really any chemistry. Obviously, you know, you look at what they have with their number one wide receiver, not trying to knock their quarterback in Houston, but um, DeAndre Hopkins is the kind of guy where you can just kind of throw a hook pass in that general vicinity, and it's going to be a, a really awesome highlight reel catch because he's, because he's about as good as it gets. Oh, my head is pounding, man. Sorry, I didn't have to say that out loud. It just kind of came out. Ugh. But I, I I do like it, and if we're talking about a guy that's that's viewed as sort of over the hill, and we get Demarius Thomas, I I think it would be a a I think what would happen is you would have some people say, "Yay, I'm glad we got Demarius," and then you would have the majority of Packers Twitter saying, "You guys are dumb. Demarius is over the hill. He's not what he used to be. This was a bad signing." And I think the the analytical, supposedly intelligent people who are trying to temper the expectations are underestimating what Demarius Thomas could offer this team. I think they're trying to sound smart without understanding that he still has some gas left in the tank. And if all we're looking for is a number two wide receiver, I don't mind it at all. But we'll see. He could, I mean, maybe the rest of the NFL fully acknowledges how good he is and he's still going to end up getting a ton of money. I mean, he's, he's done with his contract once once Denver moved him on. Um, Houston took on $4.5 million remaining on his contract. His 2019 portion of his contract was nullified. Uh, I don't know if the Broncos are going to have to eat cap on that or not. I would assume not. I don't know. Well, maybe if it was after June 1st, which it would have been, there might still be some left. Um, but anyways, that was $14 million is what he was scheduled to get in 2019. Again, he's not going to get that, but it could be in and around that. And then we got to have that conversation like, I don't know. I mean, do, I don't want to spend 12 on him. Now we're getting into silly territory. Not quite as silly as Allen Robinson for 15. That's just dumb. 
But, uh, you know, if, if we're talking about one year and we're talking about less than $10 million, I'm, I might be interested in Demarius. And I'll leave it at that. Another guy that is already a wide or a already a free agent is Pierre Garçon. Very, very, very similar to Crabtree, in my opinion. 32 years old, consistently really good wide receiver. I mean, we're talking about from 2012 to 2016 when he was with Washington, he was solid. 2017, he had a pretty good year. 2018, they lost their quarterback. The guy only played 379 snaps, and he didn't grade out all that well at all. But what do you really expect, I guess? So it is a question. Um, If you put him on a team at 32 going on 33 years old with a talented wide receiver, can I get 2017 production out of him? If I can, there's our number two wide receiver. Just tell me how much we're talking about. If you're giving me Pierre Garçon for six million bucks for one year, I'm very tempted. I'm nervous because it's possible that 2018 is just what he is now, and he's not going to be very good. He doesn't have anything left in the tank. That's not great. But give me 2017 production out of him. I don't mind that. For the record, in 2017, he was the 25th best wide receiver, making him a legitimate number one. Right? I just again, I stick with that standard. If you're top 32, you are a number one. In the NFL currently, it's 32 teams. If you're in the top 32, then you can be at number one somewhere, just mathematically, right? Probably not on every team because you're, you know, these other 24 guys are better than you. So if you're on those teams, like, for example, Marquise Goodwin was 24th, you're the number two there. But that means that there's a team that doesn't have somebody that's as good as Pierre Garçon. So he could go there and be the number one. Does that make sense? That's why I keep using that for those of you that think, why does he think top 32 makes you a number one? That's why I use that standard. He's a number one somewhere. So he comes to Green Bay as the number two, who's good enough to be a number one somewhere else. But again, that's dependent on, is he still the 2017 guy and 2018 was just emblematic of a team that fell apart after they lost their quarterback? Or was that just the wall, that it was just a coincidence they lost their quarterback, but he just completely fell off at 32 years old? My assumption is it's somewhere in the middle. Same exact thing with uh, Crabtree, right? There is some decline based on his age, but probably not as bad because Baltimore doesn't have a quarterback. San Francisco didn't have a quarterback. So, yeah, I'm interested in Pierre Garçon. Uh, Again, it's a short-term thing. I would still like to draft somebody in the first three rounds and try to develop the guys that we have because if we can get one guy in the draft and if we can get either Marquez or, or EQ or whoever, if we can just get him up to being a number three and we can draft a guy that's a number two, then we're set. We got a one, we got a two, and we got a three. Yay! How nice is that? But again, just to be clear, when you're outside of the top 100, you're not even a number three. So growth for the for the rookies from last year would mean become good enough to be a legitimate number three wide receiver. Not saying, I'm just saying. And I know, PFF isn't perfect, and they showed a lot of flashes and all that stuff, so if you want to call them a number three, I'm not going to fight you over it. Just if, if you're going to say that they are a top 50, top 64, whatever wide receiver... I, I think you're being biased. That's all I'm going to say. I don't I don't know any other way to look at it other than you're just being biased. Another guy that's available is Mr. Devin Funches. I have never, ever, ever been a big Devin Funches fan. I don't know why. I just, since day one, when they said he's a tight end turn wide receiver, I was like, nope, not going to work. Don't like that. Plus, I mean, you guys know how I operate forever. For for the entire year, I kept hearing how good Devin Funches is going to be. And, oh, man, he's going to be great for Carolina. It just drove me nuts. Because, like, no, he's not. And then he wasn't, and people wouldn't stop talking about him until eventually they just kind of stopped talking about him, like, a year or two ago. It's like, man, you guys are obsessed. He just wouldn't stop. Now, with that said, what could we get for 24-year-old, six foot four, 225-pound Devin Funches? Now, remember, he was a tight end converted wide receiver, so he kind of is a plotter. He ran a 4.7 at the combine. So you can see how he's kind of a tweener, right? He's, he runs a 4.7. He's six foot four, but he's 225 pounds. So he's, you know, 6'4", 225 is kind of big wide receiver-ish. But dude is slow. With that said, though, we are getting a, a top 50 guy. Well, I, I shouldn't even say that definitively. He's right in and around that number two range. This past year, he was 77th. I think the year before, he was like 40 fourth or something so if you if you average out what he is he's sort of a low end number two so yeah if we play that game where Aaron Rodgers makes you better okay but the other problem I have with Devin Funches is if he's going to be a slow tall guy that can't separate and you're saying oh I know what we can do we'll just have Aaron Rodgers throw it up to somebody in tight coverage Rodgers doesn't like to do that 
Maybe if he has like supreme trust in you like he does Devontae Adams, he'll throw it to you in tight coverage. But if Devin Funches can't separate, Aaron Rodgers isn't going to risk a bunch of picks just throwing it at your, you know, over your head, hoping you can go up and get it. Cam Newton is all about that. Launching it over people's heads is his favorite activity. Aaron Rodgers isn't a huge fan of throwing at tight coverage. He wants you to be open. So I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of it. As always, it comes down to the cost. But at 24 years old, I would have to assume somebody's willing to offer him more than I would prefer to pay. So I'll say I'm out. But, you know, it, it, it's kind of your thing, right? It, it's up to you to decide what you want to do. He's younger. He's a potential number two. He's bigger if you're looking for big outside as opposed to small inside, whatever it is you're looking for. I'm not trying to tell you what to think. I'm just telling you what's available in the positives and negatives, and you can figure out whatever it is you think you want to do. Just saying for me, I'm kind of out on this one. Speaking of small and shifty, Mr. John Brown, 28 going on 29 years old, Baltimore Ravens he was with the last year. Prior to that, he was with the Arizona Cardinals. Um, Bottom line is he was decent for three years. He's been pretty terrible for the last two. Uh, third round pick in 2014, 5'11", 178, ran a 4-3-4. Speedy, um, not not really slot guy. He does play on the outside. Maybe the Packers could try to put him in the slot. I don't know. But again, let you figure out what it is you want to do if that's what you're into. I'm just telling you he hasn't been a good wide receiver in a very long time. So it's another one I'm going to be out on. Uh, Jamison Crowder with the Washington Redskins. I'm actually shocked to see how young he is. I thought he was going to be an older wide receiver. He was drafted in the fourth round of 2015, five foot nine, 177, ran a five, uh, four, five, five, a four, five, six. So I'm not a big fan of any of the Washington Redskins wide receivers. You can blame it on the quarterbacks if you want. Um, you know, similar to what we've said in the past, if you erase 2018 because of the lack of having a quarterback, and you look at 2015, 2016, 2017, you're kind of you're getting an upgrade over the wide receivers we had last year. Maybe a number two, probably more a number three type wide receiver. So would I be interested? Maybe, but it would have to be for very, very little money because we're talking about maybe a top 50 wide receiver, probably, you know, more top 75-ish, right? Very similar to what I said about uh, Mr. Devin Funches. And the bigger issue I have is this is sort of the territory where I would expect if if we have guys that grow, it's going to be in about this territory. So now we're paying however many millions of dollars to Jamison Crowder to come be mediocre. And that's what I I would just like to try to stay away from that as much as possible. Just just go get Demarius Thomas for $9 million. Why are we messing around paying Jamison five, six million? Up it another $4 million and get somebody that's actually good. So I'm not super interested in Jamison Crowder either, but again... He's 25 years old. He could be a long-term situation if you wanted to go that route. If you happen to like Jamison Crowder for some weird reason, he's available. Cole Beasley we already talked about. I know a lot of Packer fans like him. I don't. He's uh, similarly talented to Randall Cobb, so just why? On the other hand, Adam Humphreys um, is another slot receiver, and I might be a little bit more interested in him than Cole Beasley, only because we did see a big uptick in his production this year. Now, we'll see... Again, this is sort of a scouting department kind of situation. Was this kind of a fluke, or did he just take a step? Because 2015, 2016, 2017, I didn't see a whole lot. Suddenly we have a top 50 receiver with, you know, 76 receptions for 816 yards and, uh, what was it, five touchdowns. Not earth-shattering, but top 50 wide receiver is pretty solid. You take that production, again, assuming we believe that that was real and that, that is him from now on, and we know he's going to be relatively cheap. You want to plug him in the slot? All day. Let's go ahead and do it. Because our competition is widely going to be on the boundary anyways with, with you know, EQ and MVS and Jamon and all these other guys, Geronimo, if he sticks around, and Kumaro. They're all battling to go outside opposite Devontae Adams. So if we got Adam Humphreys and slide him in the slot and we can get him to be a, a number two, legit number two target, I'll take that all day. But the two biggest questions, the contract, and was that real or was that a fluke? Because we saw a lot of fluky stuff with Tampa Bay this past year. Fitz Madrick, Madrick, Magic, whatever you want to call him, kind of made some magic happen with a lot of different people. So probably a little higher risk than I would prefer, but if we get Adam Humphreys, we kind of know the answer to the question that the Packers had. Either that or they're just taking a, a shot in the dark. Like, I don't know if it was real or not, but let's just find out. Let's give him a one-year contract and find out if that's even an option, which surprise. There, there's a lot of people that take these contracts, that like Bashad Breland. I never expected us to get Bashad Breeland for the con for the price that we got him. Like how is that a thing? 
Because if you would have told me that, well, maybe we could just give him a one-year league minimum contract, it's like, why do you think we could get him for that? Because if we could offer him that, anybody could offer him that. And somebody else will, and he'll go somewhere else. But then somebody else will offer more, and that's kind of what happens. More teams are interested, and the price goes up, and that's how you end up getting more money and going somewhere else. But apparently zero teams were interested, including the Packers, and then finally the Packers are like, fine, just come here. Here's $4 and a burrito. So I would assume he's going to command more and a longer-term contract, but I don't know anything. Um, Tyrell Williams with the Chargers is just a no. He was a 2015 free agent, has never been all that great, so there's no real reason to expect him to grow at 27 years old. And no, I'm not going to give him the Aaron Rodgers premium. That's just kind of silly. But finally, we've got the, the, the golden ticket himself, Mr. Golden Tate. And this one to me is, is, it's an easy yes for me depending on the price. And even then, if he's willing to do a one-year deal, I'm willing to pay significantly more. Again, the only reason long-term doesn't super work is because, again, Devontae, super expensive over the next couple of years. We're paying him in 2020 and 2021 $16 million. We can't pay him 16 and give Golden Tate 12 or whatever. Not that he would, he's not going to get 12. I'm just saying. But at 30 years old, I mean, it's just, you look at the production, the guy's never had a bad year. Um, over the last three years, two of those years have been not super great, but 2017 was arguably his best year of his career. So the, the talent's there. He wasn't having a great year with Detroit. He got traded, and suddenly he started playing a little bit better. Still had a good amount of average game. Week 11, week 12, week 14, uh, 16 wasn't very good, and then 17 and the uh, divisional game in the in the playoffs with Philadelphia were all considered average. But he had five decently solid games. And that's on a year in which he was traded, had to learn a whole new system, and it was still one of his worst years. You look at his production in 2017, he had one bad game against Minnesota, four average games, uh, two above average games, six games that were graded as good, two as very good, and one against Green Bay, obviously. He was graded as elite. So Golden Tate's a talented dude. And beyond that, he's, he's a former Lion, which just makes it all the better. Before that, Seattle, obviously, as we all remember. And I do think he's probably declining. But, I mean, his last contract was a five-year deal, which ended in 2018, meaning it was when he was very young. I mean, so so he's coming from Seattle in 2013. He's young, extremely talented. Detroit gives him a five-year, $31 million deal. So we're talking about $6 million bucks a year. I don't know what kind of offers he's going to get, and obviously he's going to want more long-term. But it, but anything in and around $6 million, my goodness. I mean, if, if he would take five... I wouldn't even mind a, super, a a longer term because now it's not even a conflict with Devontae Adams. I mean, you give him a three-year contract for $15 million bucks, and you front-load it a little bit since we have more cap now and then kind of save some of that so that, you know, in the years where we're paying Devontae a lot, we're only giving... I mean, it, and you can give him the money. You can pay him as much money up front as you want. You know, cash and, and cap hit are two entirely different things. So we can give him a bunch of money up front we can also front load the contract so that toward the end of the year, we're, we're distributing it to a much lesser degree. In other words, we're taking maybe $4 million cap hit, but Golden Tate can still make his five, six, whatever it is. I don't care how he wants to get paid. That's Again, that's a completely separate issue. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm to be honest, I'm all in on Golden Tate. I, I have no illusions about how good he is. He's not elite. He's not going to be a, I don't know if he's even a number one. He's almost a slam dunk number two. He's a slot receiver, which we need. It's a slap in the face to the Detroit Lions whenever we go to Detroit. I mean, especially since he was traded away by the Detroit Lions. So hopefully Golden Tate was a little offended by that. So the the desire to turn around and smack around the Detroit Lions twice a year is going to be somewhat appealing. We have the option of doing a long-term contract. And by long-term, I'm just talking two, three years because he's 30 years old. But that's probably all he wants. If he can get a three-year locked up, I'm sure he's happy. And again, his last long-term deal was $6 bucks a year. If we can get him for five a year for three years... I just, I don't have a problem with that, even if he slowly starts to decline. Considering what we've been paying Randall Cobb, I mean, his his cap hit last year was $12.7 million, man. And I know he, he wouldn't get that money if we decided to resign him. It would probably be in and around that $5, $6 million a year. But at 28 years old, I wouldn't be surprised if Randall Cobb gets more money in free agency than Golden Tate, even though Golden Tate's better. I don't know. We'll see. I'm just saying I'm, I'm very intrigued by the idea of, of getting Golden Tate. And I don't think it would cost a lot of money. And I think it would be cheap enough to the point where we're getting a legitimate guy 
for a price that is not break the bank, which is something that you're just not going to find. Either they have an injury history or they're going to cost too much, so it's going to be one year. Golden Tate, being an older slot receiver, there's just not a huge market for him, right? He's, he's not going to be anybody's number one wide receiver. But as, a, as, as the Green Bay Packers are concerned, who cares? So anyways, yeah, I'm interested in that one. Well, I'm going to leave her there. As I said, this was more or less intended to just kind of understand what's out there because it's it's not always as easy as just ranking them, saying, okay, who are the best guys and then ranking them. It's There's there's different questions. Where are they playing? Are they inside or the outside? Are they you know, older or are they younger? Are they faster? Are they taller? Are they strong? I mean, what, are, what physical attributes do they bring specifically? What is the trajectory? Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? What's the situation? What is the contract? How much money? Are they going to want a long-term deal because they're 25? Are they just looking for one or two more years because they're 33? These are all different factors. And everybody listening is going to have their own idea of what they're looking for. I kind of like the idea of maybe a one-year rental because we have young guys that we're grooming, because we have you know potential guys that we can draft, so that if we do one year and it's just kind of a you know push-all-in kind of year, we can kind of try to navigate that. But maybe you have a different idea. Maybe you want a big money guy for a long term, but you don't care about Devontae making a lot of money. So what? We'll pay two guys a lot of money. Whatever. Again, I'm just giving you the information. You make your own determination. And as per usual, let me know what you think. Twitter, Facebook, text or call. Let me get that number right quick. 608-501-0718. 608-501-0718. Feel free to call in, text. If you have a question, if you have a comment, if you want to let me know who you like, who you don't like, if you want to get something off your chest, what grinds my gears, what not, be sure to do that. But let me know what you think about the wide receivers. Otherwise, NFLBigBoard.com for all your draft news and notes. Packernet.com for all your Packers news and notes. Otherwise, you folks enjoy your Monday. I'm going to do my best to drive on ice slicked roads after my power steering belt just broke. So I'm sure that nothing can go wrong with that. that that'll be fine. I'll be fine. Anyways, enjoy your day. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Uh, Bye-bye.